All right, guys, so this PowerPoint is going to work through the final section of our beliefs part one pack. So it's a look at theoretical perspectives on religion. And it's really just going to introduce theoretical thinking or remind you of theoretical thinkers. And we're going to look at functionalism as a theory. Now, as we go through this, just as a reminder, um, you know, do what you can. If it doesn't make sense, don't panic. We are going to review it again in September when we come back. So don't panic too much. But hopefully this makes sense. The PowerPoint is quite basic. It's just there's no bells and whistles on it. It's just going to work through the content and hopefully give you an understanding of what we're looking at here. Now, the first task for you, it says the theoretical perspectives on religious beliefs. And there's a table in the pack. Now, it says page 26 on the slide. It might be 26 for you. I mean, for me, it's 33. It does vary. So what you're looking for is a table that says theoretical perspectives on religious beliefs. And there's a table that says consensus. And it's got blanks and gaps for you to fill in. So what I'd like to do is try and remember what you know about theoretical theory structure. So what's the difference between a structure and an action? Macro, micro, conflict consensus. Can you draw an example from some of the theories that we have already looked at? So thinking about um, functionalism, Marxism, feminism, new rights, postmodernism, interactionism and their view on religion. Just as a reminder, this diagram is one that I showed you right at the very beginning when we did core themes just about how society was structured. So the top down on the left, if you remember, that's the idea that all the norms and values in society um, are present and they work their way down through the institution, through norms and values, through sanctions to us. So it's a top down approach. Most structural theories are top down, they're macro and they look at the whole of society. On the opposite side, you have the bottom up approaches. Again, social action approaches, all about feelings, meanings for Stein. It's small scale. It focuses on the individual and the idea being that individuals create the norms and values that influences the social institutions and that in turn creates society. So we have the top down and the bottom up. The only thing that isn't addressed here is the idea of conflict and consensus. And whether a theory is based on universal agreement, everyone cooperating and getting along, or based on a conflict between two groups, maybe based on class or gender. So what do we need to think about this year? So what we're going to move on to is looking at the role of religion and the function of religion. And just like every other topic we've done, where we start off by thinking about what does functionalism, Marxism, feminism, what do these theories say about family? What do they say about education? we're going to do the same here and that's what i'd like to think about so i'm going to click the slide over and what you'll find in your pack is there's a table asking you to first of all define what the role and function is and then it asks you to think about the theories and what they might suggest now the role and function they're very similar kind of concepts the role is the, the idea of you know what's the, the the function the purpose you know what what is the purpose of that religion. The function would be the wider kind of effect or, or reason for it doing its job. So what I do is pause the video and have a go at the table. Again, it depends on your page numbers, but you'll find this table. It has functionalism, Marxism, feminism, postmodernism, and social action approaches. And it asks you to think about their role and function of religion. So pause the video, have a go. And I'm going to come back in a couple of seconds and we'll start thinking about the answers. OK, so hopefully you've you've had a think. Now, one of the things to, to talk about, obviously, with this, it's, it's quite well, probably what your first instinct was is is going to be the right answer. Essentially, functionalism, they are going to say religion has the function of benefiting society, reinforcing value consensus, shared norms and values integrating society it's for the good of society keeping it stable and safe so people go to church go to religion that they engage in that shared practice you think about the organic analogy the same idea applies the church would be like an organ working for the good of the body marxism and feminism conflict theories there's going to be a disagreement and as you can imagine the same ideas roll over. For Marxism, the inequality is between the working class and the ruling class, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Religion reinforces that inequality. Religion 
as Altazar argues, as he's argued every time we've seen him, religion is an ISA. The church is an ISA. The idea that religion is used to reinforce the division between rich and poor. And ultimately, this helps capitalism. Feminism has a similar idea. Religion reinforces gender inequality and justifies patriarchy, creating a division between men and women. Liberal feminists would look at changing religious practices, how things have improved, how there is a march of progress. Postmodernism, they're going to be all about that diversity, choice and flexibility when it comes to religion. Think about everything we've looked at recently with NRMs, NAMs and the fact that there is estimated to be about 4,300 different religious beliefs or, or things that fall under religious beliefs. So postmodernism is going to like that diversity, that fluidity, that flexibility. Globalization is a key word that links with postmodernism. And social action approaches, if we think about social action theory, it's going to be small scale, it's micro. It's all going to be about the meanings, the values, the beliefs, the motivation for taking part in a religion for the individual. So when we looked at reasons for growth of NAMs and NERMs, social action approaches are probably slightly more there. Why do people join them? What's the purpose? What's, is it gonna provide for the individual? Now, as an extra discussion, again, it could be an extra task for you to fill in this table, looking at the key theories and thinking again about whether they're macro, micro, structure, action, conflict, consensus, positive or negative and why. Now, this could be something you want to have a go at the end of the, the theory topic. You might want to draw this table out and just have a go at doing it as we work through. I'll see you today, this week, we are only going to look at functionalism. So we aren't going to do any of the other theories. You might be able to do the macro, micro, structure, action, conflict, consensus bit, but their view of religion, you can probably have a guess at, but why it's going to be quite limited. So let's get started with functionalism. So we're going to work through the pack. Again, at this point, we're at the heading where it says functionalist approaches to understanding religion. And we're going to talk through the, there's four key thinkers here that I want to introduce, four key functionalists, and we're going to just say and explain what they think about religion. All the information is in your pack. There's a few examples we're going to fill in as we go, um, but you can you can do this as we work for it. So to get started, functionalists talk about the organic analogy. So if you remember, again, ignore the page numbers I say at this point because they're likely to be out of sync. I'm on currently on page 35. Uh, you may be on a very different page altogether. But ultimately, the first question says, what is the organic analogy? And as we've said before, the organic analogy is comparing society to a living organism or a, or a living body. Every institution acts like an organ which has its own uh, separate function, but it does rely on co-independence, co-operation and interaction with the other institutions, the other organs for the good of the whole body. So, for example, the function of your heart and the function of your liver are very different functions. They have their own separate and unique job. But if one of them doesn't do their job properly, it will have an impact on the rest of the institutions, the rest of the organs and the body as a whole. So when it comes to functionalism, what we need to think about is that the functionists view of religion is they use a functional definition. They look at what religion does for the individual. They look at the, the values, the purpose, the role of religion. Right back to the very beginning of this topic, we looked at functional substantive definitions. This is the one where it included pretty much anything as a religion. Now, one thing that's new here, new concept for us, is this concept that I'm just going to highlight here, functional prerequisites. Now, functional prerequisites is a, is a tricky concept. It looks challenging, but if you break it down into its words, and what it's actually asked, and we can it hopefully simplify it. So if you think, first of all, function, or oh, we'll just go with function. So we know what something does is the function idea. Prerequisite, if we just change that sort of slightly, so pre is kind of, it's the first word, so it's something before, and instead of requisite, if we change that to requirement, so a pre-requirement, and then we swap the words around, so 
almost I always think about it is, is a functional prerequisite means something that's pre-required or needed in order to function. So think like a, a functional prerequisite of driving a car is you need to put petrol in it. The car will not drive or move without petrol. Um, and you can have more than one prerequisite. So in order to drive a car, the functional prerequisites you would need to do is buy the car, put petrol in the car, get your driving license. They would be the prerequisites, insurance, they would be the prerequisites you would need to drive a car. And the same thing here works, that if we want to have a society and we want society to work, religion provides the pre-required elements of society. So the pre-requirements would be shared norms and values. Um, it would be integration. It would be creating a sense of unity. And religion would provide those things. The, the pre-requirements or the pre-required um, elements of a society can all be fulfilled by the church or by religion. So just to go through our key thinkers, Durkheim, Malinowski, Parsons, Bella. They're not all functionalists. I'm going to kind of single out Malinowski. He's not a functionalist. He is a psychologist and an anthropologist. So actually, he isn't really a functionalist. Um, but the rest are. And Bella is a neo-functionalist. And neo, if you think about the word, just means new. So he's a newer, more modern functionalist. I say modern because he's still writing in 1972, I believe. So he's He's not the most contemporary, but he's more re recent than per Parsons and Durkheim. So he's a neo or newer functionalist. But it's not, you don't need to make that much of a distinction that he's neo. He's, you can just still refer to him as a functionalist. So Durkheim, our first key thinker here. Now Durkheim talked about religion. He, he studied a very specific group of, um, or very specific religion. Was, um, Australian Aborigines, he looked at their religion of totemism. And he, he did a lot of research on the way religion formed and the role of religion and the purpose of religion. And he called it elementary forms. It was very basic forms of religion, very small scale versions of religion. Now, one of the first things he did was when he we look at the world, Parsons said we define and divide the world into two categories, what we would call the sacred and the profane. We make very clear distinctions between the two. So something that is sacred is seen as religious. It has special religious value. Um, something that's profane has no religious value. And as we make our way through day-to-day -day life, we probably subconsciously, we can make those distinctions. Currently, I'm sitting in a classroom full of desks and chairs and textbooks and a whiteboard. The environment around me is very profane. There is there's no religious symbols or significant artifacts in the room as far as I can see. No, no, nothing here. So I'm in a, a profane, non-religious environment. If I was sitting in the church, everything around me would be sacred from the pews, the Bible, the stained glass windows, the, you know, every, the environment would be a sacred one. Now this is going to come back when Parsons, uh, sorry, when Dirkman did his study in just a second. So we'll put it in a context in a minute. So if we look at these objects here, as I said before, are they sacred or are they profane? Now, I think the sacred ones are probably easy to start with. Um, so the cr crucifix, the, I can't remember the name for the candles. Um, it's gonna bug me, but I will probably come back to it in a second. But the, uh, the, the, Jude the, the sort of the candles that are used as part of Hanukkah for Judaism, um, the Quran, these would all be sacred objects. The profane objects, the ones that have no religious symbology, would be football, would be a table, the lolly, and the American flag. So that would be if we defined, divided these objects. These are religious, these are not. However, the issue with functionism is that if we think about the, the functional definition of what something does, we've already mentioned in the past that football can act like a religious is a gathering of people with shared rituals and values and, and outfits and it can have elements that almost would make it form part of the 
uh, religious or typology. America as well, when we look at Bella, will be seen as uh, Americanism is its form of religion. But this is sacred and profane, something that's sacred and something that's not. And again, you can come up with your own definitions of um, objects. So like the Torah, which is the, the, sort of the, the Jewish version of a Bible, um, would be a sacred object, whereas a sociology textbook is a profane object. But then the context, you know, for me, that sociology textbook could be sacred. So some of the key concepts for Durkheim. So value consensus, social solidarity, and collective consciousness. Now, again, um, collective consciousness down here is a new concept for us. And if I just explain what it is, because collective consciousness is a bit like an umbrella term that covers all the other things you've talked about. So if I just draw a nice little umbrella up here, look at that art skill that GCC and art is paying off. So this is our collective consciousness cc and under this umbrella we would have and again i know i'm writing on top of text but we'd have our value consensus we have social solidarity we have unity we have integration we have cooperation oh that was a tricky one to write co-op so collective consciousness is just a a big umbrella term. So if you're wrong, saying society is based on value consensus and social solidarity and unity and integration and cooperation, you can just say society is based on collective consciousness. And it's a simpler way of saying it. it's a bit like when we did Marxism in education, rather than saying middle class kids have more cultural capital, more economic capital, more social capital, more educational capital. You could just use the, the umbrella term of habitus and collective consciousness works in the same way. So as a concept, don't panic because it's a new one. It's really just a bigger, shorter way of just rather than describing everything religion does. It's just a simpler way of putting it there. So totemism. So one of the things that Dirk did, he looked at Australian Aborigines in the early uh, 1900s and he looked at their religion of totemism. And he said that their religion promoted social solidarity, integration, providing that collective consciousness as an umbrella term. And it also included elements of sacred and profane. And I'm just going to explain what totemism is over the next couple of slides. And if you can just put a very short summary into your pack. So, as I mentioned, it's based on Australian Aborigines. And the idea of totems, you know, is, is universal because we see it with Native Americans. You know, there was the idea of totem poles there. So it is a very symbolic form of religion. And ultimately, each clan, each society, each group had a, a totem or a symbol to display that represented their group. And it would be a plant. It could be an animal. It could be an object that was sacred to that group. So if you belong to clan A and you worshipped the eagle, the eagle would be your totem. It would be your sacred symbol. For you, the eagle is a sacred animal. Anything else is profane. If you're in clan B and you worship a cactus, that is your sacred symbol. All cactuses are sacred. But the eagle is not sacred to you. And this is where there would be sometimes disagreements that some groups would see an object or an animal as sacred. Others wouldn't. And that there could be conflict arising from one group hunting or, or mistreating the sacred object of another group. So Durkheim argued that therefore Aborigines worshipped the totem. They were symbolically worshipping their society. So the totem pole, the totem symbol, it provided membership, it provided unity, integration. It all covered all those elements of the collective consciousness. And that was the role and the function of religion. It created a sense of belonging, sense of unity and drew people together under this symbolic uh, totem. So what you can think about is totems today as some examples, you know, what, what would be the totems that the symbols that you gather around in your life? It could be a football club. It could be a band. It could be the college, the six form logo it could be a symbolic totem. So you can you can use this time if you want to design your own totem pole. I'm not expecting you to do it. We would do it in lesson. But if you want to have a go, feel free even just as a, a little 
on a post-it note, stick it in your pack as a reminder of what totems are. Now, the evaluation for Durkheim, as we can criticize him, um, totems are good. The idea is useful for understanding the function of religion in a small scale society. And that's the key thing here. Durkheim was looking at a small scale society, a very small group. The religion and the idea of totems, it works here, but probably would not apply or does not apply to larger societies, particularly society with religious pluralism and diversity. Think contemporary th uh, views. And this, this is the third kind of criticism here. You know, Durkheim is writing about religion of a small group in the 1900s. I think it's 1901 he wrote this study. No, 1905, I believe, sorry. Um, so that was a very different society. If you, would this still apply today? Do we still have, you know, religion is very large scale. So it's become diverse, it's become fragmented. Would this still apply today? Postmodernism could easily criticize this argument. Now, next we have Malinowski. As I mentioned before, he's not a functionalist. He is the anthropologist slash psychologist. Now, his study and his research was based on his long term uh, study of a group in the Trinidad Islands, the Trinidad Islanders. And he, he basically built a house on in the community. He lived with them for a number of years. Um, there's some, some sort of for slightly things that he would basically select to a lot of them and father a load of children and there's some getting a bit too, you know, I suppose in terms of research, the idea about going native, he's kind of, he got too involved with the community, but ultimately he was an anthropologist, psychologist, not a functionalist, but his research is still valid. So very much a, a sort of ethnography, Verstehen seeking piece of research, participant observation. Now, Malinowski was interested in how religion developed in a response to the psychological need. And what he said was that religion would have developed under two key circumstances, times of a crisis or when the outcome of an important activity was uncertain. So people would turn to religion in these two circumstances. So times of crisis, times of change. Um, if we think about birth, marriage and death or, or hatching, matching and dispatching, not Malinowski's terms there, someone in that department came off that. But the idea being that religion helps us cope with a big change. So if I think about death as the, the example of as a social change and how religion is used, a member of a community or family dies and that's a traumatic and, and tragic event and it, and it causes a lot of disruption to that group, that society, those individuals. Now in order to prevent that disruption lasting for a long period of time, spreading and causing further disruption to the whole of society, we would engage in, in rituals like a funeral. The funeral brings people together to share in their grief, to support one another, to say goodbye to their family member. And it acts as a kind of a, a way of containing and structuring the change. And often religion can be a big part of this. So, you know, religious ceremonies and, and funerals. And then what happens is after the event, people will still carry the grief, but they return to their normal lives. Same with a marriage or getting married. You have the wedding, the big event, the big day to celebrate the change, you might have the honeymoon, but for most people, they go back to their regular lives once that's happened. And that's the idea of these symbols and these events to celebrate or recognize a big change. It helps people deal with the change and return to stability. Now, the other one is, is uncertainty in an uncertain activity. So. Malinowski noticed that the Trinidad Islanders used religion when they would go fishing. Now, if they were fishing in the lagoon, which is the sort of smaller area around the island, it was safe, it was predictable, and they were quite successful. There was no need to fear, no need to panic, so there was no religious ritual. But when they were open sea fishing, where it was dangerous, uncertain, unpredictable, they, they would be likely to use 
religion by taking magic or religious rituals or artifacts as a protection while they were fishing. Same thing could be for you guys. When you're doing a testing lesson where there's no, it's safe, it's, you know, you can get it wrong, it doesn't matter. You may not feel nervous, you may not feel the need to, to engage in a ritual. In a big exam where it's unpredictable, it's it matters and you're nervous, you might engage in a ritual like wearing your lucky pants or taking a certain pen or you have to have a certain breakfast or wear a certain perfume or aftershave. It's that you might engage in a ritual that makes you feel comfortable before going into that situation. It may not change the events, but you feel safer as you go in. So as an evaluation of Malinowski, again, just in our packs here, um, it's quite good. Again, it can be applied to funerals. It can be applied to people coping with a life crisis. But if you think in today's society, we've become more secular. Secularization has taken place. We are not as religious as we were. People find other strategies to cope with these significant events. So like I said, you know, when you have an exam, you don't pray to God's help with the exam. You might just wear your lucky pants. So that's the idea that we can, you know, there are elements of the theory which we can see in today's society, but ultimately we've become more secular. So it's not religion we're relying on, it could be other things. Now Parsons. Parsons is a really good theory, again, very similar to Malinowski. We know Parsons, he's always popping up, he's a you know, he's our armchair sociologist. He's kind of, you know, you you name a topic, he's probably has something to say about it. Now he talks about this idea of mechanism of adjustment, and actually this is really similar to Malinowski, ultimately the idea being that when we face a crisis, a sense of uncertainty, a sense of instability in our lives, we will turn to religion. Religion provides the justification, the support, the, the, the sense of protection and acts as a mechanism of adjustment. It helps us to cope and adjust to the change in our lives. So very, very, very similar to Malinowski's argument. Um, particularly the idea being, you know, if you lose your job, you might turn to religion as a source of comfort that then helps you um, potentially keep going and looking for a new job. So one of the other kind of arguments that Parsons introduced was the idea that religion provides us with the core values that enhance social solidarity. So think about the Ten Commandments as an example of this. You know, some of those Ten Commandments form the core principles of our society. You know, thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal. These are core values we, we hold in society and religion can provide those core values. Now, again, coming back to sort of Parson, uh, sorry, to Durkheim, the, the functional prerequisite arguments. You know, these core values and the role of the church provide the, the pre-requirements for a functional society. So if we want society to function, this is the pre-requirement that's provided. Evaluation for Parsons, fairly straightforward. Um, religious pluralism, diversity. How do we have those core values when there's so much diversity in society now? And then do people still turn to religion? Is religion still that source of meaning that we, we are kind of arguing that it is? People may not turn to religion in events such as natural disasters and, and death of children. Um, so really it's kind of questioning the secularization that has taken place in society today. And last but not least, Bella. Now, Bella is an interesting theorist um, because he talks about civil religion. So we are talking about a belief system, a shared system that integrates people. But we're not talking necessarily about religion in the traditional sense. So what Benner argues is that how religion provides social solidarity, unity, and in a multi-faith society, churches are not going to do that. So it's almost this higher level, this extra level thing. And he talks about very, these civil religions, these non-religious, sometimes secular events, which integrate and bring people together. Uh, and particularly, Bella talked about America. 
So he talked about Americanism and the American flag and being a proud American and all of that being a, a form of civil religion. So whether you were uh, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, whether you're Christian, Catholic, uh, Methodist, whether you're Jewish, um, Islamic, the notion of being American is a higher powerful calling. And some people will worship being an American in the same way they might worship a church. So it's got its symbols, it's got its customs, its gestures, its purpose. And so he looks at civil religion. Now, some of those practices that could be used to promote Americanism, I think like the 4th of July, which we've recently had, a big celebration of being America. America is great. Think Trump, you know, his MAGA hats, you know, make America great again. You know, it's this idea that America is the best country in the world and you should be proud to be American. Children doing the Pledge of Allegiance in classrooms every day, saluting or, or making a pledge to honour the flag. This would be the civil religion that Bella discusses. Now, if we think about Bella's civil religion, we can apply it to examples in society today. And I say UK today, these are quite um, um, kind of older examples, but think like the 2012 London Olympics, the, the Will and Kate's wedding the um, Remembrance Sunday, the Queen's 90s, you know, these were big civil events. Um, you know, we've had in recent weeks, despite lockdown, we've seen VE Day as they, you know, celebrating the end of the war. You know, that was a big civil religion, people coming together to celebrate Britishness and being British and proper British, you know. So this would be kind of the Bella's civil religion. We can see it in the UK. But it's not as consistent. American civil religion is always in your face, always got flags, pledge of allegiance every day. You know, America, I mean, even God bless America, you know, you know, this this kind of notion that American civil religion is far more continuous and more slightly more stronger. I think British civil religion is slightly reserved and often for key events and, and isn't as consistent. So Again, how useful is the contribution of functionalism to our understanding of society? So what I would like to say, just as wrapping this up, you know, functionalism helps us to understand maybe the role and the purpose of religion for individuals, how it might help society with stability, core values and integration. Functionalism ignores conflict not just in the sense of Marxism and feminism and conflict between class and gender, but they also ignore the conflict that religion causes. The, the conflict in Northern Ireland between Protestants and Catholics, conflict around the world when religions clash, I think um, sort of in uh, Israel and Palestine, you've got the conflict, you know, there is significant conflict around the world with religion being a key contributor of it. So it does ignore religion as a source of conflict rather than source of consensus. And is it useful today? I think some of the older theories, functionalism, um, like Durkheim, Malinowski, Parsons, less relevant today because society's become more secular. Bella, on the other hand, probably is slightly more useful today because he recognises the shift from religious um, kind of integration and more towards civil religion as a form of integrating us. And that could be more useful today as we enter secular society. And there we have it. I know it's been a slightly longer video, but what you have on page 38 are the concepts and key definitions for you to fill in. Um, there is uh, the kind of the answers below. There's a summary of the key thinkers. And the last one I'm going to show you is just some exam questions. You're not expected to do them, but you might want to think about um, how they use them. So there we go, some answers there for those questions. Pause these anytime so you can get the answers down. I'm looking for answers. There we go. So here are the exam questions. So just to show you the type of question that could appear for functionalism, outline explain two functions of religion, outline explain two ways in which religion helps society to function. Um, so in those two 10 markers, you could, you could use any of our thinkers. You know, what, what's the function of religion? You could go with Durkheim and the sacred profane, the collective consciousness. You could use Malinowski in the life crisis. You could use Parsons and mechanism just maybe not Malinowski and Parsons together because they're very similar notions. 
you could talk about Bella and civil religion and integration into a secular society. And then the 20 mark, sorry, the final 10 mark about the item, two ways in which religion can be seen as a uniting force in society. So this is going to come from a different topic. Later in the year, we're going to talk about how religion can be a source for solidarity or source for change. And functionalism is one element of that. So you could use functionalism for the consensus, the cooperation, the integration. But we're going to use some other theories here. But you could probably come up with some good ideas for this 10 marker as well. OK, there we have. I know it's been a slightly longer video, but this covers the final bit of the functionalism pack. Feel free to work on this. Pause the video. Use the PowerPoint. Do what you can. Hopefully this has helped. And thanks for watching. Um, again, I'm going to leave the comment section open. So okay, okay. if you need any questions, pop them in the comments or email me directly. Um, but other than that, thanks for watching.